Hello, welcome to episode 194 of the Epic Film Challenge 2, A Thousand One Movies You Must See Before You Die, 1932's Vampire, or the original title which was Vampire, The Dream of Alan Gray. Alan Gray is the main character, and uh, we follow him entering a small village, and we get the kind of the backstory that he is this guy who's interested in the occult, and he certainly gets, uh, you know, what he's probably looking for in this small village. And it's a short film, about an hour and ten minutes long, hour and fifteen minutes long. And it's this it's this fever dream, it really is. It's following this character, walking through this, you know, just dreamlike uh, setting uh, out in the woods. And there's a manor that he goes to and he stays in this little inn. And then he walks over to this big building and encounters some interesting things along the way. Won't go into too much of that, but this was directed by Carl Theodore Drea, who I'd seen one of his films before, which was The Passion of Joan of Arc, which is an incredible film but emotionally draining. Thankfully this film wasn't quite as heavy as far as that goes, but it's a wildly different film and this was Carl Theodore Drea's first sound film and boy does it show. It really feels like this film doesn't know whether it's coming or going, doesn't know whether it's a silent film or a sound film. And a lot of people see that as a big negative for this film. This film is highly regarded as a horror classic, but a lot of people do criticize that uh, that poor aspect of the film, which is the sound and how it plays more like a silent film than a sound film. Now it was shot as a silent film essentially and he recorded stuff later on. I believe they shot it in France, he did the sound in Berlin and he was a Danish director by the way. And this was like I think shot as a French film, a German film and an English film. They're going to do three different versions. So he was biting off more than he could chew in all different directions. The main character, um, Alan Gray, is portrayed by a man who gave uh, Drea some funding for the film, so he wasn't even an actor and there were other non-professional actors. There's a doctor in the film who's a great kind of, he has such a great face and this this big mustache and wild hair and he was a real highlight of the film for me and he was just someone they met on the metro apparently <laughs> and were just like, do you want to be in this film? So it, it's, it's a weird, how this film came together, it's a weird story but it's appropriate for a weird film. So Alan Gray, he comes into the small village and he's visited in his his room at the inn by this this old man who is kind of just talking gibberish and he leaves a package that says do not open until I've um, passed away and so Alan Gray he goes he goes outside and he goes into this um, this building and there's just weird stuff going on and if we look to the original title which is The Dream of Alan Gray that very much clues you in as to what the film could very well be it could just be a, a, a complete dream sequence and an hour and ten minutes long you know, uh, it's almost feasible that this whole movie is a dream, or that the first few minutes are real, and then when he wakes up in the inn, that's when everything starts happening and going weird and all that kind of stuff. And I don't usually like films where it's like, oh, well, maybe none of it's real, or oh, maybe it's all metaphorical. I felt like the plot was well done. I liked how it was kind of a throwback to the silent era, even though it's not really a throwback because it was right on the cusp of sound films first starting. It definitely feels like a film with one foot in the silent era and maybe two toes in the sound era. The sound isn't very good and it's very sparse, but I loved that about it because to me it played like a silent film, which I love anyway. I love the sensibility of a silent film where you get to kind of really take your time with the story and you get these intertitles that come up and tell you what's happening. Alan goes to this place and he meets this person and uh, and, and all that kind of uh, backstory was uh, really helpful to me in kind of piecing together what was happening because otherwise it's just a guy wandering around looking at stuff and just barely reacting to what's happening. He's not a great actor, but he's this vessel for this... Again, this dream of a movie. There's just weird stuff happening. I love how we saw these these phantom-like entities uh, personified through shadows. You know, there's a great that the first time we see it, he's walking across a riverbank, and on the other side of the river, where a person would be, you see the shadow in the water. But there's no person. There's just a shadow, or a reflection, I should say. And then then we see shadows. There's a a, a really hypnotic shot of a guy shoveling in reverse. So like the 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 dirt is coming into his shovel and then he's putting it down like that and it's just the shadow of him and there's lots of that in the film where there are shadows where there aren't people and it's so well done I was just kind of really impressed with the technical side of this film and also the way that Drea used the camera I'll get to that in just a second just to kind of wrap up the story a little bit so really we see Alan Gray entering the village he goes to an inn he stays there he gets left that mysterious package by the guy who says only open this when I'm dead and then he goes up to this manor. And this is where you could kind of make a case for the film being a dream because he enters into the manor and the old man gets shot dead. 
that's when he opens the package and it's a book about vampires and he starts reading it and throughout the film we'll just see shots of the the pages as he's reading them and some of the editing was a bit clumsy there because it would be on screen for just long enough for you to read it and then the next shot was far too short I had to go back and pause it and then the next page was far too long I was just rereading it over and over again just because I was bored you know so that was a bit of a shame not done too well but I liked having that kind of snippets of what he was reading not the full page you know so you're kind of like oh what's that next sentence you know and the next page it's something else but you're getting all this key information about vampires and kind of the law and for me this is this is kind of a dracula film it's about a vampire that's kind of haunting this this village this town and there's mysterious things going on there's murders going on things like that but it's very self-contained and feels very immediate it's not this thing that takes place over a long period of time it takes place over an hour and 10 minutes and we see alan gray going into this manor and interacting with the people there and as I said this is where you can make a case for it being more of a dream because they almost accept him as part of the family almost instantly this guy just walks into their house and they're like oh and they you know there's no kind of questions asked whatsoever now you could say it's one of those small towns where people just welcome in anyone but you know to me it's almost like a dream where you know you, you walk into a house and you're just immediately part of that situation and you slot in and stuff until other things start entering the dream that aren't part of the normal safe part of the dream that you've constructed inside your head. There's a couple of villainous characters who seem mysterious at the beginning and their true intentions become slowly unraveled and unpeeled as you read more of the pages of the book and a few characters read from it so we get to kind of have Alan going off and doing other things and someone else finds the book and they start reading it and so and they get on the same page, <laughs> literally, about what's going on with this vampire in the village. I loved the character who turned out to be the vampire. I thought it, it was a nice way to subvert it in a way, even though this is way back in... 1932? It was, uh, it was a different kind of uh, uh, character to be the vampire, I think. And, uh, and that character was really creepy looking like just had a that the, the face of the actor had uh it just seemed weathered and it just seemed uh it was an old person and so i don't know i really liked who the vampire ended up being and that was a very memorable character for me in the film even though they have no lines and are just there to kind of be creepy and the film is creepy there's some interesting stuff to do with skulls that comes into the film just these these um like this is like a small skull with a massive over large head that really creeped me out it's like something around an alien movie you know um just really ethereal imagery as well and as i said the directing the cinematography so ahead of its time uh this for me right now i would say is probably the best shot film uh, as far as doing stuff that's ahead of its time that i've seen this early and it's mainly when the camera's inside the house and it's moving through the hallways as the characters are coming in and out of rooms and kind of doing things and things are going on and the characters are moving and the camera's just gliding through the hallways and it's just so ahead of its time. You know, it just seems to kind of um, uh, predate a lot of those films that really started moving the camera in that kind of smooth, silky way. Like you'll see people using the camera in that kind of way in silent films where... I think in Metropolis, Fritz Lang's classic, you know, he had like three tracking shots in that entire two and a half hour movie. It wasn't done very much, but this film, Vampire, had a lot of tracking shots and placing the camera in different ways. There's this weird sequence where Alan finds himself inside a coffin and we see the point of view shot as, and there's a window over his face so he can see them hammering it down. It's really like unsettling, you know, just, just imagining being inside a coffin and getting to see them nailing it shut around you. And then he gets carried outside of the building and we get the point of view shot of the trees going over. It's just really nice playing with where the camera is and how that tells the story. I was so impressed by the acting isn't great, there's a couple of actors who were professional actors and one of them in particular did a very good job. She was a woman who was in the manor and she'd been bitten basically. Later on she leaves and she comes back inside and she's clearly gone mad and that is a great scene with some really affecting acting. I thought she was great in that moment. And the aforementioned coffin scene was really interesting to me. Again it plays into it being more of a dream than reality because Alan sits down on a bench and then he kind of comes out of himself like as a kind of like a half shell. It reminded me of um, Buster Keaton's uh, Sherlock Jr. when he falls asleep and then like a ghost version of himself wakes up and steps outside of his body. It's the exact same thing. So he leaves kind of like a see-through version of himself on the bench and he walks off as a see-through version of like a half version of himself. And then he finds himself in the coffin as a fully formed, you know, self. And then he, the coffin gets carried outside and it moves past the bench where he sat as the half shell and he comes back to life. Made no sense whatsoever, but it was just 
that creepy idea of being put inside a coffin and being nailed shut into it and carried off to a graveyard. One thing the film really doesn't benefit from is that it was done on location and the, it's a shame because the film has such a great handle on the visual style. Uh, Andrea used a lot of kind of gauze over the lens so that things would appear kind of um, not blurry but kind of uh, softer, that's the word. Of. The image is softer in some scenes and that again just adds to the dreamlike quality of the film but on location it's, it's meant to take place over a night and they're shooting in the day so you have characters running around with lanterns and it's a sunny day and it's uh, and a lot of films back in those days suffered from this you know the vampires from 1915 really suffered from that where you know you have a lot of scenes take place at night and you can tell it's the middle of the day there's people walking around you know um, in this one again it you can just tell it's a bright bright sunny day and it's meant to take place at night and they're holding lanterns it just it falls apart as far as that visual aesthetic unfortunately I just feel like if they'd been able to film it at night on location and just get some lights in, even if it's unnatural, and just you know light it more atmospherically in, in a, a nighttime setting, it would have been so much better. It would have been incredible to see that. I think of something like The Phantom Carriage, which has a lot of scenes take place at night, and they look fantastic, and the mood that is evoked from that film in the nighttime scenes is really something special, and here it just, it's such a shame. It feels like it's just, it's one step you know, missing from a full kind of, you know, there's just, ah, uh, it's really frustrating, you know. Um, but it almost does play into that kind of dreamlike feeling of the film, but I'm not making excuses for it because that's definitely not the intention as far as I'm kind of concerned. Um, it's just kind of one of the pitfalls of doing stuff on location back in those days and probably on a budget as well. If you had to get funding from the guy who wanted to be in the, the lead role of the film, then clearly he didn't have the big, biggest budget in the world, so... It was what it was, but that really drags the film down. But for me, everything else is so good. And the fact that a lot of it is so silent, and then we'll hear dialogue every now and again, and it kind of almost surprises you, like, oh, yeah, it's, I forgot that it's a, it's a sound film, it's not a silent film. But I love that. I love that kind of awkward, not sure what it really is kind of feeling, and that just enhanced everything else about the mood and uh, feeling of the film. And there's a really grim sequence towards the end where a character gets kind of uh, sentenced to death by uh, slow... Um, flowering basically is a guy who's stuck in this chamber and they're just pouring all this flour in and it's slowly like just coming up over his face and it's really kind of unsettling I never thought that someone getting drowned in flour would be so creepy and unsettling um, but yeah there, there's definitely flaws to this film and you know I could I could list more if I wanted to but I just loved the visual style of it it was just creepy it was just uh, eerie you know without going too far in that direction a lot of people have, have said that this is um, borrowing heavily from the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. I don't even think so, really. I mean, it gives me a similar feeling, but I just feel like the way that Drea shot this and the way that he presented everything was a bit different to me. And in a lot of ways, I almost feel like this is my favorite, you know, Dracula film, even though it's not a Dracula film. I just liked how it wasn't the... It was a vampire film from back in, back in those days, uh, you know, in the early days of cinema, but it wasn't this... You know, Dracula story, where, you know, the guy goes and visits Dracula in the castle, then he comes back, Dracula comes with him, and they, all that stuff, which I've seen so many times. I just liked a, a really good, well-made vampire film done in this style that you just couldn't do again. You couldn't go back and, and make a film like this and do it in black and white and, and have the half sound half. Like, there'd be no reason for it. You'd just be copying it, I suppose. But it's one of those films that is just a one-off, you know. And a lot of that has to do with the, you know, the sound and the silent. And I'm just blathering on at this point, but I really did love this film. I think it's a, it's a really standout horror piece that really captured a, a feeling of, of dreams and nightmares and that unsettling feeling of, of coming across things that you don't want to come across. You know, just like a scene when a guy is walking down the stairs and Alan Gray is looking up at him and he comes down and it's just, I don't know, there's just creepy stuff about the film. As I've said many times, I don't get really scared by anything and this film certainly didn't scare me, but I love the eerie feeling of it. And I'm just repeating myself so much. So I'll leave it there. Is it a film you should see before you die? Absolutely, definitely. Vampire was a great horror film. And usually I get really hung up on these movies where it could be all a dream. You know, and, and really it, it kind of could be. But for some reason the, the strength of the way this film looked and sounded uh, and didn't sound when it went completely silent um, just captured something. There was just such an atmosphere to this film. And sometimes it's nice to just really experience something like that. Uh, even if the story isn't as tight or you know there's some flaws and some seams around the edges like some of the acting or the uh, you know the, all the stuff that takes place on a sunny day when it's supposed to be taking place at night so yeah 
definitely one you should check out. Uh, it's not for everyone. I can definitely see people losing their patience with this one, but for me, I loved it. So there we go. Thank you for watching. Leave me your thoughts down below if you've seen it, and I'll see you in the next one.